ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. After having done this show for some years now, it surprises me how often people dislike hearing the sound of their own recorded voice played back to them. Part of it, I think, is because your voice sounds different in the open air than it does when it's resonating in your head. And so it sounds like you're hearing someone impersonating you, which can feel really unsettling because our voices are closely bound up with our sense of identity. John Colapinto is here. John is a staff writer at The New Yorker. He's also an amateur rock vocalist with a damaged voice. John is the author of a book about the miracle of the human voice, the ability that humans have to push up air from our lungs, through our vocal cords, to speak and sing and make our inner thoughts intelligible to other people. And John found that when it comes to speech, what we say is really a kind of song that reveals all kinds of things about us. John Colapinto's book is called This Is The Voice. Hello, John. It's lovely to be speaking with you. Likewise. Hi. Nice to talk to you. I don't think I really thought about what a vocal cord really was. I think I might have imagined it was a cord, a kind of a string that was being played somewhere down my throat. Can you explain what a vocal cord really is? Yeah, it's a misnomer chord that comes from the 17th century, an anatomist that got it wrong. It's really a valve. Our vocal cords are the two sides of a valve. Imagine a membrane that has a nice slit down through the middle of it. Not unlike our lips, actually, when we lightly close them. And when we make vocal sounds, our, that valve is closed and we push air up through our lungs, much as we do when we flutter our lips by blowing what's called a Bronx cheer here in the United States. I don't know if anyone else uses that term. And our lips flutter together in this sort of spluttery way. That's what our vocal cords are actually doing in our throat. And that's really all we're doing to make real vocal sounds. Um, we've just got this weird sort of fluttering buzz in our throats, which is really the, that valve rapidly opening and closing and chopping the airstream into pulses that we hear as sound. And it's really that continuous buzzing sound that I'm now making, which we sculpt into language by very rapidly and accurately moving our lips and tongue. So we've got this astonishing coordinated action going on, but it all begins with these misnamed vocal cords, which is really a valve. You point out that when we make the decision to stop listening and start to talk, just as I'm doing right now, there's a transition there that, that's going on inside our, our vocal cords. Can you explain what's going on there? You mean literally when we decide to to speak, what do we what do we actually do? Yeah. Well, as I'm listening to you ask me a question, I'm happily breathing in and out by opening that, keeping that valve completely wide open. And I literally do that so that I can pass air back and forth in my lungs and not die. But when I want to answer you, I have to quickly slam those vocal cords shut and time this air that I flow up through them in order to make these sounds in response to you. So as we are speaking, we're actually exhaling and we're slowing down the rate at which we ordinarily exhale. We exhale in order to get rid of poisonous gases in our blood, actually. So um, <laughs> when we are speaking, we're actually, we're actually in a little bit of danger of, of, of poisoning ourselves because we are slowing down this, this act of exhalation. It's really quite remarkable. <laughs> There's some kind of delayed device there that'll eventually shut us up at some point. <laughs> That's right. How are we different from the other apes? How, how are their voices different from us? Well, one of the huge ways is actually in what I just said, because if you think of how apes make noises, you'll hear like, ah, ah, you'll hear these sort of short bursts of sound. 
Interestingly enough, they lack the control that we have over our, over our diaphragm to allow the air to be exhaled slowly. Everything about a remarkable speaking apparatus has to do with differences in our brain, but again, also in our body. So we refined over the course of evolution certain muscles and the control of those muscles in our diaphragm in order to ease out the airstream long enough for me to say this sentence instead of just saying, oh, so that's one way in which we differ from apes. Another way that we differ is where our vocal cords or our vocal valve is placed within our throat. And it's inside this boxy chunk of cartilage called the um, larynx. And you can see it in men with the Adam's apple in the middle of our neck. Actually, an apes would be way up, much, much higher in the throat. They're, our larynxes descended down our necks over the course of evolution. The reason that that's important is because it really does provide a kind of bigger resonating space in the vocal tract, this sort of vertical section of the throat that then bends 90 degrees into our mouth. And believe it or not, this angled vocal resonating chamber is why we can speak language because the way we move our tongue permits us to change the shape of those two parts of the vocal tract so that we can say the vowels, A, E, I, O, and U, those sounds, A, E, I, O, U. If we couldn't do that, and if we could, we would be like apes that can essentially just make sort of a ha huh sound. So if they tried to say who hid the head in the hut, they would say, huh, 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 huh. you know, it would, it would all be on one vowel. And we sort of never think about how incredibly important, I mean, vowels are the game changer. So, because we can then differentiate words with these vowels that we, that we actually construct just by how high we move our tongue or how forward we push it. And that's all got to do again with where our larynx is in our throat. It's crazy stuff. So, Planet of the Apes, apes together, strong, that could never happen in other words. It could not happen. No, I'm afraid not. The only person that could talk in that movie is Charlton Heston when he says, get your stinking hands off me, you damn dirty ape. One of my favorite lines of dialogue, actually. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> babies, newborn babies. How different are the voice boxes of newborn babies compared to older children? Yeah, babies are born like chimps, like apes. The larynx is up high in the throat where I mentioned apes have them. And, um, and the reason it's way up there is because babies have to breastfeed. And this position of the larynx permits the milk that they suck to flow around the sides of the larynx and down into their stomachs while they continue to breathe. Because otherwise, they would actually suffocate on the milk. They can keep their lips latched onto the breast. You'll think of that when babies do that. They can keep it there for a long, long time and they breathe happily through their nose. We couldn't do that because of where our larynx is. The milk would actually go into our lungs and we would drown. So interestingly, as a baby starts to move towards eating solid food, it starts to be able to swallow. Really what's happened is that larynx has started to move down the throat in order to produce that extra resonance chamber that's going to permit the baby to start being able to say vowels eventually. And all of this is so beautifully timed, you know, as I'm, you know, as we become mentally capable of speech by learning from our parents, hearing them speak, we actually then evolve or, or change into an animal that can actually say the words that we're learning because that larynx is moving down. We're also gaining control over our diaphragm and so on. As newborns, we can do a whale, a sustained whale, but we start to perfect that a little bit as we get a little bit older and start to cry for specific food or to indicate pain or, and so on. We, we get a kind of control over that diaphragm that's going to permit us to speak sentences. We male humans, we have voices that break during puberty. What's going on in our larynxes and our voice boxes, if that's the word for it, while our voices are breaking, John? Yeah, the same thing is happening that's happening to the rest of our bodies as males. Our larynx is suffering a massive growth spurt. And that's really because our testicles have this time-released explosion of testosterone androgens <laughs> that they release into the bloodstream at puberty. And really what happens, it's so amazing. 
<laughs> Those hormones flood the body. They attach onto tissues like bones and and muscles in our in our arms and so on. And and we build big arm muscles. We we start to stretch out our skeletons. Grow. In, in other words. Everything under the power of these androgens blows up in, in size and strength. And literally the same thing is happening inside our throat. As our larynx suddenly gets bigger, we our Adam's apple starts to protrude in that point on the, uh, that you can see on the neck. And that's really because our vocal cords are lengthening and they're getting longer. And if you think of, a, of an elastic band that's thin and short and stretched taut, it will give a a high-pitched sound if you pluck it, but a lower, fatter string will vibrate slower, and so you'll chop the air slower and you'll have a deeper voice. The reason the voice breaks is really because we are very, very used to as children to speaking with these much thinner, lighter vocal cords. And it takes the male animal a little while to relearn how to use those vocal cords and change their pitch smoothly because they're changing in shape so quickly that we sort of miss, we kind of miss fire and we make squeaks and weird noises until we get control of them. John, is there a theory in evolutionary biology why, why this happens to males and not to females? Yeah, there are a lot of theories. Whether or not they're right is who knows. But I think the, the most interesting thing I read about was this idea that goes back to Darwin that all males you know, are, are these, these creatures that have two ways of winning a mate. One of them is by wooing the the love object with a plumage or physical expertise or strength and so on. But the other way is to drive off rivals, uh, other male rivals, because we're all competing for the female. So one of the ways that we compete, interestingly, is by threatening vocal noises. And one of the things that we do with our voice in order to threaten another person or Animals do this to each other, mammals across the board, and birds. They, they, incredible studies have shown that it's, it's consistent across all species that make vocal noises. To be threatening, we lower the voice. It goes down. To, in order to be submissive and kind and loving, the voice goes up. Why on earth would this be? Well, think of a violin which has a small body and think of a big bass that has a big, big body. Well, the bass has a big body in order to resonate, to produce a deep noted sound with, with when it's being bowed. And so we're doing the same thing with our voices. By lowering them, we are suggesting, we are bluffing. We are saying, my body is big and threatening. Even if we're a small mouse, they literally will lower their voice. Or if you're a big, huge bear and you want to show another bear that you're kindly, they make vocal noises that are high pitched. So I guess what I'm saying is it has nothing to do with the actual size of a person or an animal's body. This is a, a literal size bluff achieved through lowering the tone, the, the pitch of the voice. Humans actually went lower than almost any other species in, in relation to females. We have the widest uh, disparity. It's a whole octave between the sexes in human beings. We really drove that, that vocal bluff home as, as human males. And it seems as if females rather like it because studies have shown that college age women, when they're tested for what voice sounds sexier, they tend to like the lower voices, the lower the better. Yeah, but there's swings and roundabouts with that, John. Like, I've got a honking baritone, but, but I've, I've discovered that it's the guy with the sweet, high, troubadour tenor voice as he sings. That's the guy that gets the girl in the end. Have you noticed that? <laughs> yes. Well, there is a fascinating wrinkle in what I just said, and that is that women like the higher-pitched male voice. They actually say they like a higher-pitched voice when they are not menstruating, when they're in a calmer sexual state. They're not as lusty. They're, they're not as randy, and they're actually in a more rational state of mind. So they actually are... They they actually then pick a slightly higher male voice. Why would this be? Well, the belief is that they are able to read through vocal register how much testosterone a man actually has in his system. Remember I mentioned before that our vocal cords thicken under testosterone. So the 
over incredible long periods of evolution, women have sussed out that the guy with the slightly higher voice is a little less mm, malely driven, a little less aggressive, and probably a little less likely to go out and search for other females besides her. In other words, he'll stick around to raise the baby they make. Wow. And this is literally what the theory says. It's that they are able to detect in the voice the guys <laughs> that are more likely to rush out there and try to, you know, inseminate lots and lots of females. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just crazy, but there's so much information that's packed into just these little differences. It's completely fascinating how much information is understood and projected from, from this, pro this process. Now, you have a very gravelly voice, John, and that comes from a kind of injury. Tell me how that happened. Yeah, I was, um, I've always sung all my life as an amateur singer. I was um, tapped to be in a rock band when I was 40 years old. I worked for Rolling Stone magazine for years, the music magazine. And the owner of that thing put together a rock band. They wanted me to sing in it. I had never sung professionally, so I knew nothing about doing proper vocal warm-ups. So I just threw myself into these extensive rehearsals with a loud rock band without any preparation. And, you know, I mentioned that our vocal cords are a valve, and that means that it's fluttering. As it flutters, the, the two sides of the valve are banging against each other. And if you drive your voice hard, one of those vocal cords or both can start to bleed through overuse, through not warming them up. And that's exactly what happened to me. And you get really, you get a vocal bleed, which turns into a bruising, which turns into a kind of scar tissue, or it can. And what that is, is a little lump on the edge of one of the sides of the valve. So that when my vocal valve opens and closes, instead of meeting flush the way it should and giving a sweet, smooth sound, I've got this little bump there which creates this rattle in the voice. Air is escaping through the, the closed valve in ways that it shouldn't. The weight of that vocal polyp, as it's called, is actually affecting the vibration, as you can imagine, of the vocal cord itself. So I can't sing as well as I used to. I go off pitch because it's all about control of the vibration and I can't control it very well anymore. So that's a long explanation for what's going on inside my throat when I've got this gravelly sound. Would it be possible to get them surgically removed? They can be surgically removed. It's quite a an ex big operation. You're in the hospital for a while. You you have to be six weeks of vocal silence. And I've never found a time in my life when I can easily budget that that time. And also, I'm a writer, and I have to be quiet anyway. So that moment when you injured your voice was the rehearsal process. And there's this evil thing that goes on when bands rehearse that's not often talked about. But as you're rehearsing over a couple of hours, guitarists and the bass players will just, just walk over to the amp and just tweak the, the volume up just a little bit louder during the course of that time. And eventually the band goes from being quite loud in rehearsal to being very loud by the end of it. That is dead right. Dead right, absolutely. They're just sneaking their amps up, yes, and the vocalist is trying to get up over top of them. There's no doubt about it, yeah. So when your voice became injured during this process and it came time to perform, what did you hear in your voice that had changed and, and in terms of the authority you needed to project as the singer in this band? Wow, great question. Um, the, the terrifying thing was that the, the vocal cord was definitely compromised and probably bleeding on the very night of the performance. And what I noticed was that I could not, for some reason, get the power, the volume out of my voice. And it was incredibly hard to get the high notes that I had been getting in rehearsal. So it was just this feeling of fragility. Were you in any pain? No pain. There's no pain receptors in the vocal cords, so you feel no pain. Nothing warns a singer that this has happened. But as the minutes ticked down to my having to go on stage in front of 2,000 people, many of them celebrities, because this was a Rolling Stone, you know, uh, Christmas party, uh, it really was deeply terrifying because I could feel this compromised throat and I couldn't put my finger on what was wrong and I really wasn't sure that my voice would be there when I was standing there behind the microphone and I you know I managed to find the notes but man it was hard it was and I'm sure I further damaged my throat that very night because I just had to work so hard to get the sounds. How did you become aware that it might be more serious than just a scratchy throat? Yeah, well, it would not go away. And I'd had scratchy throats in the past. And gosh, it was months after the performance, actually. I was getting on the elevator in a new building I'd moved into. I held the elevator door for a, one of my new neighbors. 
And she, when I said to her, what floor? Because I was going to push the button for her. She said, ooh, you've got a very serious voice injury. I said, oh, no, no, no it's nothing. And she said, no, 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 I'm a vocal coach for Broadway singers and actors. And, you know, I can tell you, you've got a problem. And um, oh, believe it or not, I, I just ignored it even after that until, gosh, it had to have been a few years later that I was doing a story for The New Yorker about a vocal surgeon up in Boston who was famous for saving Adele's career, the, the wonderful singer Adele. She had a polyp exactly like mine. He removed it and her voice was saved. Well, I phoned him to ask if he would be willing to be interviewed and have me hang around and watch him operate. And I'm not kidding, I didn't even have the sentence, the first sentence out over the phone that he stopped me and said, whoa, sounds like you're dealing with a pretty serious vocal issue yourself. So when I got up to Boston, he insisted on on looking into my throat with a with a laryngoscope. Actually, I, I had looked, I had had it laryngoscoped after my neighbor pointed it out. I'd forgotten that, and sure enough, I had the bump. Well, when this vocal surgeon looked at it again years later, the guy that had operated on Adele, it had gotten that much bigger, and he said, "Whoa, this is one of the biggest I've <sighs> I've seen." He said, "You know, you you know, you you can't possibly sing with this," and I said, "No, no, I can't. You're darn right." So that's when I knew, you know, it sort of really came into focus what a, what a nasty I'd done to myself. You mentioned there that having the polyp removed would entail a very long, very complex, slightly risky and unpleasant operation. Tell me what you found out about Julie Andrews, the famous singer from The Sound of Music. What happened to her and her voice? Yeah, you know, she went in for uh, what I assume was a standard polyp removal. You, you take that bump off the vocal cord. But it's extremely delicate surgery because the way that you remove it is you slit open a very thin membrane that's over the, this little bump and you have to not damage that membrane. And then you just remove the part that is scar tissue. And if you take any of the healthy vocal cord, you can leave the person with an even worse voice. You can create a, a sort of permanent gap where the where the vocal cords close. And there's any number of ways in which you can screw that up as you take that little bit of, of tissue off of there. And I watched Zytel's, the name of this doctor up in Boston, actually do this surgery. And he had the person under deep, deep anesthetic and a paralyzing agent. The person was lying there with their whole throat, you know, pulled open with this, this device. And he was reaching down the throat with tiny scalpels and scissors that were mounted on things that looked like knitting needles. And he was staring down the throat with a stereo microscope and having to manipulate these tools with minuscule movements of his fingertips. You literally couldn't see his fingers moving, but if you looked at the device through the, the microscope, he had it projected on a screen for us to see in the operating room. You could see that he was moving the tools with beautiful precision to slit open that membrane, shell out the mass, and then just let the membrane close on its own and so on. So I could see he was famous for having sort of the best hands in the business. They simply did not shake. They did. There was no tremor. When he operated on Adele, there was fans outside the, uh, the hospital waiting to see if it was success, and he knew it, and, and, and plus the world's press. So he was able to do this surgery on her, knowing that there was this much pressure on, on the result. So whoever operated on Julie Andrews was not as precise as him, that's for sure. And well, that was the end of her career then? That was it? Correct. She just couldn't, could not sing anymore. Yeah. There was the state premier of New South Wales, Neville Rand, who had a wonderful barrister's voice. And he had something like that happen to him. And at the end of it, his voice was a very crude, low volume, raspy croak. And he said that cost him the chance to become prime minister. He said that was it. He couldn't really project his voice. And any hope he had of being prime minister after that was lost. You, you have to speak around your injury now. How do you do that? Because, like, I'm hearing a lot of colour in your voice, John. Have you got workarounds for that? Yeah, well, you know, you actually develop... Like, right now I'm trying to speak quite smoothly, but now I can sort of let the rasp come out a little bit more. What I'm doing, and Zytel was explained this to me, was I had actually retrained myself. I had relearned subconsciously how to find those parts of my vocal cord, we'll call it, that, that could at least vibrate a little more smoothly. I'm doing it unconsciously, but I'm doing it with muscular effort. And Zytel's insisted, I was actually 
because I was trying to find a pitch that worked, I was often speaking more monotonically in a more of a monotone than I ordinarily would do. Now, I think I am able to give emotion in my voice, and I think I can ride the sort of swells of up and down pitch that give voice color and expression, but I think I have to work harder to do it. Um, my voice will sometimes break up, as I think it did just a second ago, but I achieve anything that sounds like a smooth tone through extra effort. There's, there's no doubt about that. It's interesting what you're, what you're saying about the politician. I think a voice damage like that too really couldn't be in campaigns over the long haul because you're just bellowing speeches and doing interviews and the voice would just degrade. And, and yeah, so I can see why he very much felt it ruined his, his chances for, for high office. But someone like Bill Clinton, interestingly, would constantly injure his voice during campaigns. But it sort of gave his voice kind of a homey, you know, down home kind of a thing. And, and yeah. you know, it sort of depends <laughs> on what, you, what your particular <laughs> appeal is, you know. And he was suddenly like the warm and friendly horn dog kind of a guy, you know. I did not have sex with that woman. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, you know, and for any <laughs> assertion you can make about the voice, there's almost its exact corollary that can be equally true because the voice is so richly colored. It's so prismatic and so you know, symphonically interesting. And there's so much going on that, you know, it's very, very hard to make a hard and fast rule about a voice that is going to lose you elections or win you elections. And that's sort of the also the fun of writing about the voice and thinking about it is just how richly layered it is in what it's communicating. Podcast. Broadcast. This is Conversations with Richard Feidler. Hear more conversations anytime on the ABC Listen app. The voice that you're using now after you've injured your voice, as you say, you're, you've found a way to bring colour into it. You were able to reintroduce something that linguists call prosody. Is that how I say it? Can you explain what that is? Yeah, it comes from two Greek words, pro, which means toward, and sodi, which means song. So it's, it's a great way to remember what prosody means. It means toward song. And we speak with prosody, meaning we speak toward song. We are actually, and you can hear my voice now, we are actually, I'm going up and I'm going down and you're doing it as well. We do it when we tuck a little phrase into, uh, into our sentence that, and then we pick up the rest of the sentence at a higher pitch. It's the melody and rhythm that, we, that our words ride upon as we speak. And if we don't speak with prosody, then we speak like this and no one would be able to listen to this interview. I think I just lost us a bunch of listeners. People just turned it off. <laughs> it's, and, and I mean that almost not jokingly because it really is part of the seductive enchantment of the human voice. Pe some people use that melody better than others. You, you sort of can't turn them off. You know, it's partly because they're saying interesting stuff. But sometimes it's just that they are, you know, awesome orchestrators of the sort of pregnant pause in a sentence, you know, the suspenseful little gap and then filling it in and, and the sudden use of a bit of a growl and then riding into a higher register and then down into a lower one to say something kind of confiding and then back up again. So, you know, I very much think of the voice of, as this beguiling instrument. Birds, male birds, woo female birds with their bird song. And in a sense, we as human beings are doing this to each each other all the time. And the best speakers are doing it, are using prosody as this incredibly hypnotizing, beautiful song-like uh, way of communicating. So we are more bird-like than we give ourselves credit for. We think we're plodding along in written prose, you know, a gray page of words. No, no, no. Right now, you're not, you're not looking at at airborne words on a page as I speak. You're hearing someone sing. 
There's an avant-garde music group in Brisbane in Australia called Topology and they did a thing a while back where they were getting speeches, famous speeches from Australian politicians and putting music to them. And in doing so, they revealed all the kind of hidden music behind it. There was a famous Australian Prime Minister called Gough Whitlam and in one of Australia's biggest political crises, he gave this speech and Topology put a waltz behind it because it turned (laughs) out he was speaking in a waltz. Oh, that's fabulous. He said famously... Well, may we say God save the Queen, because nothing will save the Governor General. Two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Ah, so there's a chicken and egg thing going on here, and I just wonder if if Gough Whitlam spoke like that because he'd heard a bit of what, quite a, a bit of Johann Strauss as a kid, or whether the waltz comes from our habits and patterns of speech like that. Oh, what a great question. I don't know if the answer's known. I mean, my guess is the latter, that maybe waltzes come out of speech, come out of our evolving as a species that was hearing people sometimes break into that waltz rhythm and and it did a certain thing to the listener. Um, Maybe it was the storytellers around the campfires or the medicine man or the shaman and these particular rhythms that then found their way into music. I love that as an idea. I can tell you I read widely enough in in prosody to, to believe that, you know, Every imaginable theory has been put forward, but it was actually Darwin that said the earliest evolution of our language capacity came out of singing, out of singing apes. Uh, so, I mean, you know, this does chase its tail. But but Darwin did have that wonderful insight that nobody else had when they were trying to figure out how did the, uh, our species start speaking Everybody did the natural thing, which is to say, oh, yeah, someone had to come up with the first word. So they would always think, gee, you know, they went from a grunt meaning bone or, or, uh, you know, a whale meaning dog. But that really wouldn't work because we have grammar. It's not just indicative sounds that mean uh, an object in the world. What really communicates is grammar, which is a flow of words. So this has always been the bugbear of language evolution. Like, my God, where did grammar and sentences come from? It took Darwin, a raging genius, more than I had even realized, to say, oh, no, no, that melodic sound, there was a singing ape that was communicating emotions. You know, I want to mate with you or I want you to get off of my territory using particular songs that do that. And there are gibbon apes that do this. Um, so it does all come back to our our beautiful capacity for music and melody and singing and and or, or what we call prosody and speech. It's so important. You know, one of the most thrilling, and I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not exaggerating in any way. One of the most thrilling moments of my life happened when my daughter was two, and I had to travel interstate, and I had this very long, long phone conversation with her because grammar was just starting to come into her speech. She'd gone from saying no a lot to um, to actually being able to construct sentences. Mm. And I had this very long phone conversation with her as I heard her going, and 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 then and then we we got in the in the car and 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 I can I could just almost hear the cogs in her head whirring oh, at this yeah. incredible speed. And I was aware of that theory at the time that we really don't get a proper sense of self. We don't really get to individuate ourselves from our mothers until we have language. And so what I could hear coming together in her head at that age was her her sense of self starting to come into focus, which was incredibly thrilling. What what do we know about this process, John? And what have you found out from that about this process of how the self sort of comes into being through the use of the voice and language? Oh, that's a great, that's a great story and a great question. You know, when you really think about it, there's almost nothing more individuating about us than our voices. Of course, the way we look is also huge. But the voice is a fingerprint too. I mean, it's so unique to each one of us for so many reasons, partly just our physical makeup, that vocal track I mentioned, its size and shape and the inner geometry of it, um, which is going to give different timbre and resonances to the way the voice actually sounds, just that sound quality, but also the shape of our lips and how we, and tongue and the way our S's and P's sound. But then also 
these temperamental things of personality, someone that's laid back, you know, speaks a little slowly. You know, they don't do, they don't worry too much. But like a writer from New York might just talk your ear off by talking really fast. So a kind of pressurized speech might come out of someone that's got a temperament that's much more aggressive and driving. I guess what I'm saying is that your child at that moment was also hearing herself. She was putting together words that were actually expressing thoughts in her head, but she was doing it with a melody and, and in a sound that she would have been realizing was her, that was sounding only like her, not like anybody else. So she's discovering herself as this voice is coming out of her, and it's imprinting on her as well in a kind of feedback loop who she is. And then as she gets a little bit older, maybe she's going to school and she has classmates that she wants to impress or enemies that she wants to drive off. And what does she start to do? She starts to perform herself a little bit more, starts to play with this vocal instrument and the melodies and the sound and the volume. Let's never forget volume from loud to soft. So all of a sudden she's She's creating a symphony and she's orchestrating. She's up there as the conductor, you know, a little bit more violins there and so on and slow that bit down. And so it, she's weaving a personality around this stream of, of language and prosody and music that's coming through her lips. So we, yes, we invent ourselves as, as people. And, you know, it's funny. I mean, I'm even thinking now our appearances, yes, we can affect them with our clothing and how we style our hair. But those things, are, they look more superficial. They, they can appear they, even to people looking at us. But that voice, that thing that's coming out of us, my God, that... First of all, it's invisible. You can't see a voice, but it, it's so endemic. It's so ingrained. It's so who we are. Um, and you've actually helped me bring that into focus uh, in differentiating it from the other ways in which we are, are, are different than other people. It's something we cannot control almost. We weave it in a very young age. The other thing she was doing in talking to me on the phone was, and I know this might sound a bit pretentious, but she was bringing time into her life because she told me a story. She, it was always, we got into the car and then we went to Nana's. Yes. You know, so this happened and then this happened and then this happened, one after the other in a sequence through time. Oh, that's great. That's the first thing she wanted to do if, as soon as she had grammar. Yes. As soon as she was grabbing a grammar was to tell a story, to go, oh, we did this, then we did this, and then we, did, and then we ended up there. She kind of got the sense of introducing herself into time in the world. Otherwise, before then, I think it's all just a cycle of feeding and sleeping, feeding and sleeping and, you know, bashing toys on the ground. Yes, absolutely. And, and think of what she's drawing up in the way of memory, too. She, she remembers that she did these things, and she's converting that into a stream of language. Yes. And she's having to struggle a bit to do it because it's new to her. But as she does it, too, she realizes she's making sense of her world. She's making sense of time as a, as a, uh, a sequence of things that she can tell, but also something that happened to her in the past that she's now relaying to you. So, so much is happening through that act of converting experiences she had into a stream of what really are just air vibrations. You know, I, we, we've talked about the voice as physical, th a physical thing we do and a mental thing. But really what we're doing is we're, convert we're making the air around us vibrate in very complicated patterns that permits us to implant our thoughts into each other's heads. You know, it's, it's really uh, almost like a science fiction thing. I'm, I'm putting my thoughts into your brain by making the air vibrate interestingly. And that's what your daughter was doing and learning to do. I mean, we are a remarkable species. If we watched a, a, doc, a nature documentary about us, you know, we'd be calling our wife in from the other room. You're never going to guess what these things do. My God, it's incredible, you know? You know what I mean? They're making the air vibrate in ways that are moving, transporting thoughts around. That's right. Look at this. There's a two-year-old who's introducing narrative and, and time-lapse and assembling <laughs> speech and, 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 and breaking it down into nouns and verbs and adjectives. It's amazing. <laughs> exactly. Well, John, here's, the, here's this really big question, I think, that lies at the heart of this. And I know this is something you're trying to address in your book, which is what, what does the science tell us now? Do babies come into the world with basic grammar and syntax pre-installed like an operating system that's sort of pre-installed or do they pick it up from their carers yes well it was believed by since the mid 50s or late 1950s um that really language was was 
inborn. I mean, I say believed because the most important linguist in the field, Noam Chomsky, had become world famous really by, by making the claim that we must come into the world with our language fully intact because we learn it just too quickly. By the time we're two years old, as you say, we're starting to make sentences. And that's way too fast to learn something as complicated as language. But Chomsky did not account for certain things. One of them being that babies actually get a head start even before they're born, when their fetus is in their final trimester. They are hearing a remarkable amount of human voices, and particularly the mother's voice. Now, because they're in the womb, it's kind of muffled, like listening to someone through a wall. So it's not as if they're hearing clear words, but what they are hearing incredibly well is the prosody, is those waves, that up and down movement of language. They're also hearing when the mother's pressured or angry, so they're hearing maybe the voice speed up and maybe raise or lower in pitch. And when I say hearing it, they're floating in amniotic fluid and the vibration that move through her body that actually set that amniotic fluid into vibration so that they're feeling the voice against every part of their skin, the soles of their feet and their legs and their chest. So it's not just hearing it. So in other words, the and they're in the dark and they can feel nothing else but the human voice vibrating against them in these waves and changing pitches. They're then born into a world where they are just immersed in the sound of language all around them. Studies have shown how incredibly fast they are picking up on language. Chomsky's main way of proving that we are born with language was to point out that we can move chunks of language around in ways that could only be inborn. And I'll tell you what his example was. He said, you know, uh, you say to someone, um, a unicorn is in the garden. Babies learn very quickly to say, if they want to turn that into a question, to say, is a unicorn in the garden? And they do that by moving the is to the front of the sentence, the verb. Now, Chomsky said that's a simple mental operation. But if you change the sentence to a unicorn that is eating a flower is in the garden, he said if you take the is, the first is in the sentence and move it to the front, you get nonsense. Is a unicorn eating a flower is in the garden? And he said that's, you know, so babies know to move the second is to the front. In other words, to move this other chunk of language forward to the front. Now, they choose the correct verb to move. So he said, you know, this could not be learned very quickly and it could only be learned with great effort and so on and so forth. Well, he wasn't accounting for prosody. Listen to what our voice, voice does when you say, is a unicorn that is eating a flower in the garden? Or as a statement, a unicorn that is eating a flower is in the garden. We drop our voice to tuck in that little phrase prosodically. Our voices tuck that in. Now, you may think we don't, but listen to me if I say a unicorn that is in the garden is eating a flower. We simply do not do that. We lower it in a pitch that can be so subtle that it can almost be only picked up by acoustical instruments that measure voice. But it drops as we tuck that in. Babies are learning in the womb that mum is tucking phrases in. They can't hear what the phrase is, but they know that language is built out of chunks of melody, little parts that drop low. So when they want to make a question, they take that part that is spoken as a tucked in lower pitched phrase and they slide it to the front and lo and behold, they can move these chunks of grammar that Chomsky said are incomprehensible as separate chunks unless you know this incredibly complicated mental computation. But actually, if you pay attention to the singing that we're doing and that babies are hearing from day one or even before day one, you start to understand that in fact, language, its major structures are indeed learned in the sense that they are picked up through hearing voices speak. That's how we're getting it. Well, what happens when you turn that upside down, John, when you remove the carer? Because there are those really horrifying stories of children who fall into the, quote-unquote, care of psychopaths who raise them in a dungeon somewhere and they never are given speech. They don't have any verbal interaction. 
with any other human being. You hear these, these, these stories, it's very, very rare, but they, it, this does happen sometimes. What do we know about children who have grown up in such an environment where there is no carer to help them develop speech? Yeah, there was a famous case in America called a, a young girl named Jeannie, who, as you say, a psychopath kept her in a back room of the house. Nobody could ever spoke to her and so on. And fascinatingly, when she was discovered at the age of 13 by caring people and brought to linguists and psychologists, they discovered that she was normal, you know, in, in intelligence, not, she could not speak. She could not learn language. And what that tells us is that there is a critical window of learning. And we know this for a whole bunch of different things in, in animal behavior. But, uh, when the brain is super plastic, in other words, circuitry is being literally wired in the instance after we're born, the first inputs of, of sight and sound are actually doing things to our brain that are wiring up circuitry. But if you don't hear the words that ride those melodies that we talked about. If you're not, and if you're not hearing those melodies consistently, then you're A, you're not getting words, you're not getting how words map onto objects in the world, but you're certainly not getting how words are linked together through this beautiful flow of sentences and prosody. So that if, if your brain hardens up, as it were, if, it, if its circuitry kind of gets completed, you really never get it. You can't get it at 13. So this child was unable to develop language. And other, other you know, of these wolf children, as they're sometimes referred to, are, are exactly the same way. One of the great gifts Australia has presented the world is the habit of speaking with a rising inflection at the end of a sentence. Britain got really angry with Australia for a while because <laughs> Australian soap operas were ah. being played like Home and Away and Neighbours in the UK. And and Britain was blaming Australia for introducing the rising inflection at the end of the sentence as a way of speaking. Oh. I must admit, I I find it really annoying because, the, I, and I was trying to think why, and I think because there's a slight element of coercion there when you end a sentence with a rising inflection because it's it's demanding that, you know, you have to sit there and keep listening to me because I haven't quite finished oh. what I'm about to say. And after a while, I just feel like, I'm ready to give myself a ballpoint tracheotomy after three minutes of that just to distract attention from, yes, from it. Yes. That's a way to get out of that conversation. Oh, yeah. I, I must say um, that one of the ways that we orchestrate conversation, in other words, when we know to speak after someone else has spoken so we don't overlap, science has shown us that we're actually doing amazingly interesting things with pitch. So our voices are doing a trajectory where indeed, as you're really implying, our, our voices kind of go downward in pitch to settle and show the other person my sentence is ending, you can speak now. But you're absolutely right. If the, if the voice is always kind of tending upward in pitch, the other person is threatened never to get a word in edgewise because they don't know when the monologist is going to stop, is stopping, in fact. <laughs> so yes, I love your word coercion. There is a, there was a coerciveness to that. There is a, a thing called upspeak here that really comes out of California teenage girls where they end everything on a question. It's quite deliberate. Like they actually go up so much that it really does sound like they're asking a question. And I find that to be sort of defensive because they're never able to say something assertive. So I love what you're saying that if it's subtle enough, it sounds like coercion. If it's super exaggerated, it sounds like a kind of constant begging for affirmation. Um, what I think we can both agree on, on is that it's incredibly irritating because it's a little bit artificial, perhaps. There's other ways of, of performing this act of coercion while speaking. And uh, Donald Trump has a little tick, which is to say, okay, <laughs> at the end of a sentence, he says, you can't trust the mainstream media, okay? Mm -hmm. Like, okay. <laughs> and his, his pitch is uh, quite a bit uh, higher, actually, than someone like Barack Obama, who has that kind of resonant baritone. What does he do to compensate uh, for that high pitch tone of voice? What Trump does, and famously when people imitate him, they extend their lips outward in sort of a strange pursed look, almost as if they're trying to create like a trumpet bell with their lips. <laughs> and, and actually what that does is acoustic instruments show that that lowers the pitch, the perceived pitch of a voice, interestingly enough. It lengthens the resonance chamber of the mouth just enough to give a slightly deeper voice. And I am utterly convinced that Trump 
as a teenager, noticed that his voice was not changing to be as high, as low, I should say, as his schoolmates. And he was threatened by it and he needed to be domineering. And he did something that was unconscious. You know, I talked earlier about unconscious changes I made to smooth out my voice. Well, we're doing that, or your daughter learning to speak and creating a self. Trump was creating a self where he was trying to compensate. And I'm convinced that's why he started to stick his lips out in that way. <laughs> and he also sort of does that strange timbre that I'm doing right now, which I think he thinks also gives his voice a more impressive sound. Meanwhile, John, despite the evil polyp on your vocal cords, you're singing again in a band. What the hell, John? What's going on? Oh, my God. You know, at the age of 63 now, I can't... <laughs> <laughs> I realize I've got too little time left on the earth to not be singing. <laughs> you know, it's just such yes. pleasure. And and that's sort of where the mystery of voice finally is, is kind of impenetrable because anyone that sings knows that they are kind of releasing their... I'm going to say the word soul without being convinced we even necessarily possess one. We you know, something is happening to give me an inner peace and completion and sense of bliss when I sing that is quite unlike when I speak. Interestingly, I don't know what's happening when we sing. It has the word chant in it, which is also related to enchantment. We're enchanting listeners, but also ourself. And so, yes, I play keyboards in a rock band. And when all of a sudden there was a few songs we did where my vocal register could manage the song, lo and behold, I found myself singing it at great further risk to my voice. Like what songs are we talking about? What can your voice tackle these days, John? Boy, my voice can tackle the song uh, Six Days on the Road, which is a trucker song, which if you don't know yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great, great song. Love that song. Great lyrics. Um, that's one of the songs I sing. You know, I can actually sing songs like... I can sing ballads like Let It Be if I put it in a, in a lower um, key. I can actually move the key down. I can actually find that part of my vocal cord that'll vibrate smoothly in certain keys, singing keys, interestingly, but it's not reliable. I mean, I will literally um, hit a note sometimes where the voice just drops out completely. There's silence or it's crackles. And so it's not reliable. Yeah, which is a, a shame for me. It really pains me. So this is a nice point to end, really one of the truest joys in life is singing with friends, isn't it? Because, you know, once you're singing together, then no one's really arguing. The harmony you make is a, is a social harmony. That's a beautiful observation. It's absolutely true. That's right. It's that universal language to melody. We can, we can all do it. It doesn't matter what language we speak. John, it's been completely fascinating speaking with you. I've so enjoyed this. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Richard. Real pleasure. This is Conversations with Richard Feidler. abc.net.au slash conversations is our website. I'm Richard Feidler. You've been listening to a podcast of Conversations with Richard Feidler. For more Conversations interviews, please go to the website, abc.net.au slash conversations. Hey Conversations listeners, Miyuki Okiranta here, host of the Earshot podcast. And if you love compelling and candid first-person stories, then let me tell you about episode one of our new season of stories all about remembering and forgetting. Memory can be a trickster, a soother, a tormentor. But what would it be like to have no memories at all, to forget who you are? I had no recollections, I had no fears. The Australian band Rocket Science, fronted by singer-songwriter Roman Tucker, was labelled the next big thing. But everything changed when Roman had a serious accident and lost his memory. Do you know who I am? I guessed. I said, my auntie? And she said, no, I'm your mother. Check out the Earshot podcast to hear Roman's story about trying to remember himself to rebuild his identity. Find us on the ABC Listen app.